So let us start today with the electron transport chain and you should look at this lecture only once you have gone through the lectures on glycolysis and the TCA cycle. Also, I have uploaded a document on the LMS which talks about the chemiosmotic model and the proton motive force and you will understand this lecture if you go through that particular document before you listen to the recording. What we are going to do in this particular lecture is to recap some of the basic concepts regarding mitochondria. We are then going to look at the transfer of electrons through different complexes present in the mitochondrial inner membrane. We will talk about the chemiosmotic theory and ATP production, but as I mentioned, if you have read the document that I have uploaded onto the LMS, you will understand this section better. We will then talk about the regulation of the electron transport chain and lastly we will focus on inhibitors of electron transport chain which are of pharmacological and uh, toxicological importance and you should focus on this part specifically because questions are asked mostly from this particular section. So let us start first with the general architecture of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria has an outer membrane and it has an inner membrane and the inner membrane is thrown into folds and these folds are known as Christi. Most likely you have already encountered these terms when uh, Dr. Nerissa covered um, the different aspects of the cell in her lectures on cytology. The space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane is called the intermembrane space and this intermembrane space is extremely important as we shall see in the course of the lecture. Now what is the general concept related to the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain operates between the mitochondrial matrix and the intermembrane space. Uh, sorry about the spelling error here, just remove the N. So this is the intermembrane space. So the electron transport chain operates between the mitochondrial matrix and the intermembrane space. And what happens is that there are specific complexes which are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane and electrons are transported from one complex to the other and concomitant with this electron transport, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix into the inner membrane or intermembrane space. This creates a proton gradient and then the protons come back inside the mitochondrial matrix through another complex known as the ATP synthase complex and in doing so they produce ATP. Also, during the electron transport chain, oxygen is reduced to water. So coming back, in the electron transport chain, we have transport of electrons through specific complexes that are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Along with the electron transport, protons are pumped out from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space and these protons then come back inside the mitochondrial matrix 
across a concentration gradient and when they come back inside the mitochondrial matrix this particular enzyme the ATP synthase enzyme helps in the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate so that's actually the overall summary of the electron transport chain now this is like a balance sheet of the NADH and FADH2 molecules that are produced during the process of glucose metabolism I already talked about this in the citric acid cycle lecture and asked you to do the calculation with regards to the number of ATP that are produced but if I want to have a bird's eye view I will see that in glycolysis I produce two NADH molecules and then when pyruvate is oxidized to acetyl coenzyme A I further produce two NADH molecules from two pyruvate molecules and in the citric acid cycle I am producing six NADH and two FADH2 molecules leading to the formation of 10 NADH molecules in total and as well as two FADH2 molecules and the aspect of the electron transport chain is to regenerate NAD and FADH2 from these um, from these protonated forms of NAD and FAD so in the process of glucose metabolism under aerobic conditions I produce a total of 10 NADH and two FADH2 molecules and the electron transport chain oxidizes these 12 high energy electron carriers to regenerate these electron carriers which are then used back in the citric acid cycle now what I have done here is to upload a very small video which summarizes the whole process of the electron transport chain now I am not going to talk about the mathematics in relation to energetics of the electron transport chain because it is quite complicated and frankly it is not required for you but you need to understand the overall mechanism of the electron transport chain so the first thing is the The first thing is the mitochondrial electron transport chain operates by using electron energy for pumping electron uh, pumping out protons so if I start this particular video you will see that as electrons approach the complexes and they are transferred from one complex to the other protons are pumped out from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space which increases the concentration of protons in the intermembrane space and once this happens the protons then come back inside the mitochondrial matrix across a gradient and in the process of coming back the energy that is generated by the protons is used for the synthesis of ATP by ATP synthase which is a complex present in the inner membrane of the mitochondria so this brings us to the definition of the proton motive force so the proton motive force is the energy of the proton concentration gradient and this energy helps in the synthesis of ATP 
by the catalytic activity of the ATP synthase enzyme. So if I look back and rerun this video, I will see that as electrons are transported from one complex to the other, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space and at the last step these protons then come back inside the mitochondrial matrix through a complex protein known as ATP synthase and in the process ATP is generated from ADP and inorganic phosphate. This particular process we will look at in detail in, uh, in the succeeding slides. That means how uh, protons are helping in the synthesis of ATP. I will discuss this in detail in the coming slides. So let's move on and the first key fact for you is to remember that the enzymes and the electron carriers for electron transport which participate in the electron transport chain are located along the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this is a take home message for you that all the enzymes and the electron carriers required for transport of electrons in the electron transport chain are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the key goal of this lecture is to describe the transfer of hydrogen ions and electrons in the electron transport and the process of oxidative phosphory, uh, phosphorylation that leads to ATP synthesis. As I told you, I am not going to focus on the energetics related to electron transport because it will make the lecture overtly complicated and frankly it is not required for you for the purpose of assessment either at MBRU or for any of the licensing exams. So in the process of glycolysis the coenzymes NADH and FADH2 are produced from glycolysis and oxidation of pyruvate and the citric acid cycle and in the electron transport chain this NADH and FADH2 are oxidized to provide energy for the synthesis of ATP. That's like the definition of the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain is also known as the respiratory chain. So don't get confused if some book or in the exam, if a question is posed where the term respiratory chain is used because they mean the same. So what happens, the process which uh, what is taking place is that protons and electrons from NADH and FADH2 are passed from one electron acceptor or the carrier to the next until they combine with oxygen to form water. And energy released during electron transport is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate by the process of oxidative phosphorylation. If I look carefully in this particular figure, I see that there are four complexes that are involved in electron transport. So electrons get transported from complex one, complex two, complex three, to complex four. And as electrons are transported, and as you noted in the video, Protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. And at the end, these electrons are accepted by the terminal electron acceptor that is oxygen, which I mentioned 
in the citric acid cycle as well. And by accepting these electrons, oxygen is reduced to water. In the process, the protons that are pumped into the intermembrane space create a gradient across the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. This gradient creates a force called the proton motive force and therefore hydrogen or protons then come back inside the mitochondrial matrix through another complex known as complex 5 which has ATP synthase activity and while coming back the energy that is released is used for the synthesis of ATP. So the whole process here is to pump out protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space and these protons then come back inside the mitochondrial matrix creating a proton motive force which facilitates the synthesis of ATP by the catalytic activity of the enzyme ATP synthase. Also you should note that in the process NADH plus H plus is oxidized to NAD plus and FADH2 is oxidized to FAD and both this NAD and FAD then go back into the citric acid cycle to perform their normal function. So which we have talked about in the citric acid cycle lecture. So this actually summarizes the whole process of the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain. Now we will have to look at the different complexes that are involved in the electron transport chain. In the book, they will be numbered as 1, 2, 3, 4, and of course, the last one is complex 5, which is ATP synthase complex. But when we look at this particular figure, we will see that complexes 1 through 4 are involved in electron transport and concomitant with this transport of electrons, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. So what is complex 1? The complex 1 is called NADH coenzyme Q reductase. There is a space between Q and R which I do not know why it is not showing up, probably because I am using a Mac and sometimes this kind of uh, formatting errors show up when uh, PowerPoint is being used on an older version or uh, older version of PowerPoint is used on a Macintosh machine. But the first complex is the NADH coenzyme Q space reductase. Complex 2 is succinate coenzyme Q reductase. Complex 3 is cytochrome C reductase. And complex 4 is cytochrome C with the space between C and O oxidase. So if I go back again to what I said when I started this particular slide, 1 through 4 complexes are involved in the transport of electrons. And while they are transporting electrons from one to the other, protons are pumped into the intermembrane space which creates the proton gradient and the proton motive force which I defined in my previous slide. So now we need to look at the individual complexes in a bit of detail. So we first start with complex 1. So in complex 1 electron transport begins when hydrogen ions and electrons are transferred from NADH to complex 1. So if I look at it here, electrons and protons are being transferred from NADH to complex 1. And in the process, NADH is regenerated to NAD plus and NAD plus then participates in oxidizing more substrates 
in oxidative pathways, especially the citric acid cycle. And this we talked about in the lecture on citric acid cycle. Now the hydrogen ions and electrons are transferred to coenzyme Q, which is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the coenzyme Q is then reduced to coenzyme QH2. And coenzyme Q is responsible for carrying electrons from complexes 1 and 2 to complex 3. So if you can see here, this is complex 1, this is complex 2, and coenzyme Q is responsible for the transport of electrons from these two complexes to complex 3. Now we look at the electron transfer in complex 1. Now during electron transfer, and I mentioned this when I started the lecture, hydrogen ions are pumped through complex 1 into the intermembrane space, which produces a reservoir of protons and creates a hydrogen ion gradient. Now for every two electrons that pass from NADH to coenzyme Q, four protons are pumped across the mitochondrial membrane, which produces a charge separation on opposite sides of the membrane. So the electrons get transported to coenzyme Q and the protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix inside the intermembrane space, which creates a charge separation, especially because now you have more protons on this particular side of the membrane and you have less protons in the mitochondrial matrix. And in the process, if I want to write an equation for this, I have NADH plus H plus plus coenzyme Q, which gives rise to NAD plus and reduced coenzyme Q. Now we come to complex 2 and when we come to complex 2 the first and the most important thing is that complex 2 consists of the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase from the citric acid cycle. So this particular information is very important because it is often asked in assessments. So in complex 2 Coenzyme Q obtains hydrogen and electrons directly from FADH2. This produces coenzyme QH2 and regenerates the coenzyme FAD. And FAD then becomes available to oxidize more substrates, especially in the citric acid cycle, which we have already seen. What you should note here is that there is no pumping of electrons taking place from, uh, from, complex, uh, from complex 2, from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space, as we saw in the case of complex 1. So, com coenzyme, uh, so complex 2 and coenzyme Q are responsible for the regeneration of FAD, and this FAD is then available to oxidize more substrates. And if I want to write a balanced equation for it, we have FADH2 plus coenzyme Q, which regenerates FAD and coenzyme QH2. Now, if I look at the electron transfer in complex 2, coenzyme Q obtains hydrogen and electrons directly from FADH2 and becomes coenzyme QH2. Now two electrons are transferred from the mobile carrier coenzyme QH2 to a series of iron containing proteins which are called cytochromes. And electrons are then transferred to two cytochrome C molecules which can move between complex 3 and complex 4. And this is cytochrome C. And you can see here cytochrome C can move between complexes 3 and complexes 4. But what you should look here, along with electron transfer that is taking place in complex 2, no proton is being pumped out into the intermitochondrial space or intermembrane space of the mitochondria. 
So now we come to complex 3, which is cytochrome C reductase. And cytochrome C contains iron either in ferric or ferrous state. And when it is receiving electrons, it is reduced to ferrous. And if it is being oxidized, it is oxidized to the ferric state. And it generates energy from electron transfer to pump four protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space, which increases the hydrogen ion gradient further, which has already been created by complex 1. So remember that complex 1 also pumped out four protons. Complex 2 didn't pump out any protons. In complex 3, we have further pumped out four protons into the intermembrane space. So you have coenzyme QH2, and then we take two cytochrome C molecules where the iron is in the ferric state. And as electron is being transferred from coenzyme Q to cytochrome, coenzyme Q becomes oxidized, two protons are released, and cytochrome, the iron in cytochrome is reduced to the ferrous state. Now we come to complex 4. At complex 4, 4 electrons from 4 cytochrome C are passed to other electron carriers and electrons combine with hydrogen ions and oxygen to form two molecules of water. And energy is used to pump protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space which further increases the hydrogen ion gradient. So which of the following complexes doesn't create a proton gradient, although it participates in electron transfer? The answer is complex 2. Whereas all the complexes from complex 1, 3, and 4 are involved not only in electron transfer, but they are also involved in pumping protons out from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. Also, at complex 4, because of electron transfer, there is a terminal acceptor of electrons, and that terminal acceptor of electrons is oxygen, and by accepting electrons, oxygen is then reduced to water. So, I again repeat this particular aspect, which is the terminal electron acceptor in aerobic metabolism of glucose and the answer is the terminal electron acceptor in aerobic metabolism of glucose is oxygen. So at the end when oxygen has been reduced to water we have created a gradient of protons across the inner membrane and between the mitochondrial matrix and the intermembrane space. Now these protons have to come back inside the mitochondrial matrix. So before we go there and how these uh, protons come back inside the mitochondrial matrix, we talk about oxidative phosphorylation. So energy is coupled with the production of ATP in a process called oxidative phosphorylation because it is involving the production of ATP. We call it phosphorylation of ADP. And the process takes place according to a model which was first proposed by Peter Michel. And this model is known as the chemiosmotic model for which Peter Michel received the Nobel Prize. What this model says is that it links energy from electron transport to a hydrogen ion gradient that drives the synthesis of ATP. What is chemiosmosis and what is chemiosmotic model? As I said, you should read the handout that I have provided on the LMS before you listen to the lecture because there the chemiosmotic model is described and discussed in detail.
Now, this particular phenomena allows complexes 1, 3, and 4 to act as hydrogen pumps producing a hydrogen ion gradient. And it, it equalizes the pH and electrical charge between the matrix and intermembrane space that occurs when protons must return to the matrix. So, chemiosmosis is the migration of ions across a semi-permeable membrane similar to osmosis, but here it is the migration of ions across a semi-permeable membrane. And in the chemiosmotic model, the return of the protons inside the mitochondrial matrix takes place through a fifth complex, which is known as ATP synthase. Now let us look at the fifth complex or ATP synthase. So, in the chemiosmotic model, hydrogen or proton cannot move through the inner membrane but returns to the matrix by passing through a fifth protein complex. So, this is the fifth protein complex. This is the structure, or the three-dimensional structure of the fifth protein complex. Of course, you need to realize that this is, this is the inverted model. So, this is the in, intermembrane space and this is what the ATP synthase looks like. So hydro, uh, protons cannot move through the inner membrane but returns to the matrix by passing through a fifth protein complex in the inner membrane called the ATP synthase or complex 5. Now the flow of protons from the intermembrane space through the ATP synthase generates energy that is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and PI. So, ADP and PI plus energy that is generated by the migration of the protons in the presence of the enzyme ATP synthase leads to the production of ATP. And the process of oxidative phosphorylation couples the energy from electron transport to the synthesis of ATP because electron transport creates the proton gradient which creates the proton motive force and this proton motive force helps in the generation of ATP by the participation of the ATP synthase complex. So what we are going to do here is to try to understand how the ATP synthase complex functions. It's not an easy way to discuss this because there are many models talking about generation of ATP and I'm not going to focus on any of the models but simply try to understand the generation of ATP by the migration of the protons through the participation of the ATP synthase complex. So if I start this uh, particular video you will see that this particular part of the ATP synthase complex is rotating as the protons keep entering from the intermembrane space into the mitochondrial matrix. So if I look at it, you can see here this particular thing is rotating and this rotation creates the energy and this energy is then used for the synthesis of ATP. You can see here ATP and PI are combining as this particular part is rotating as the protons keep on entering into the mitochondrial matrix. So let us go back and see this again. We have the rotor which is rotating and as it rotates protons enter and this rotation creates the um, gives the energy which is required to synthesize ATP by combining ADP and inorganic phosphate. So look at it here, protons enter the rotor or this particular part of the complex is rotating and the rotational energy is then used for the synthesis of ATP. I am playing this again and again and you can see here how this particular complex is operating you can draw an analogy about the function of this complex with that of the windmill. When the wind uh, 
strikes the blade of the windmill, the windmill rotates and in the process of rotation, it generates energy that can be harvested for different kind of use. The same thing is happening here. The protons are entering across a gradient, creating a proton motive force. This proton motive force is rotating this part of the complex. This rotational energy is then used for the synthesis of ATP. So this is how the ATP synthase complex functions and this is how the proton motive force helps in the generation of ATP. As I told you, there are various models that have been proposed in order to describe the function of the ATP synthase complex. Uh, and I am not going to look into that because frankly, frankly, they are not required for, for your assessment, both at MBRU or uh, elsewhere. So we move on and we come to the regulation of the electron transport chain. The regulation of the electron transport chain, unlike the regulation of glycolysis and the TCS cycle, is pretty straightforward. Now, electron transport is regulated by the avail availability of oxygen, ADP, inorganic phosphate, and NADH. So, electron transport decreases with low levels of any of these compounds and decreases with the formation of ATP. So, if I have low levels of oxygen, electron transport chain will be impaired. If I have low levels of, uh, uh, if I have high levels of ATP, electron transport chain will be impaired. And this, of course, by now you should be able to logically deduce because if the cell has enough quantities of ATP, it does not require to synthesize ATP. And that is the reason any process that generates ATP, for example, the electron transport chain or glycolysis or citric acid cycle that facilitate ATP synthesis will be impaired. When a cell is active and ATP is consumed rapidly, Elevated levels of ADP will activate the synthesis of ATP. So if the levels of ADP are high, electron transport chain will be activated. So the take home message is the activity of the electron transport is strongly dependent on the availability of ADP for ATP synthesis. If I have high levels of ADP, electron transport chain will be facilitated Whereas if I have low levels of ADP or high levels of ATP, electron transport chain will be inhibited or impaired. We switch gears and try to look at some of the inhibitors of the electron transport chain. And I have to tell you that this particular part of the lecture is very, very important and unfortunately, you need to remember some of these inhibitors. So what I have done here is to go through the different assessments, uh, not only at MBRU, but also looking at the books which focus on the licensing examinations and isolate, and I have categorized the inhibitors according to their site of action. So. If you remember the site of action and the name of the inhibitor, you should be able to answer specific questions related to these inhibitors very easily. So what I have done in the first case is to look at the inhibitors of complex 1. And I have just written as C1. So this is complex 1. So the inhibitors such as barbiturates or sedatives or barbiturate derivatives such as amobarbitol, they are responsible for inhibiting complex one. So what will happen if I inhibit complex one? NADH will not be oxidized to NAD plus. So the levels of NAD plus will be decreased if I add one of these agents inside the cell. 
or more precisely the mitochondria. So I have shown here barbiturates, rotenone, which is a broad spectrum insecticide, pesticide or a pesticide. Then we have, I have also looked at pericidine, which is an antibiotic, antibiotic, then chlorpromazine or an antipsychotic medication and guanethidine, which is an antihypertensive, but which is currently not used or has been withdrawn. So if I look at any of these chemicals and if I add it to a cell, the effect that we will have is not only the impairment of the electron transport chain, but also there will be depletion in the levels of NAD+. However, since complex 2 and all the other complexes are functioning, most likely the oxidation of FADH2 will not be affected that much. Similarly, when I have inhibitors of complex 2, I will completely impair the oxidation of FADH2 to FAD and the inhibitors which do so are malonate. Again, this particular inhibitor we have talked about quite in detail when we talked about competitive inhibition. And then we have carboxin, which is a fungicide, and thenonyl uh, trifluoroacetone, often abbreviated as TTFA, which is a chelating agent. So any of these chemicals, if I add to the cell, the levels of FAD will be depleted. Then we have uh, inhibitors of complex 3. So what happens if I have an inhibitor of complex 3 is that I will not be able to transfer electrons from complex 1 and complex 2 to complex 4 because complex 3 acts as a bridge between these two complexes and complex 4. And of course, if I add these inhibitors, the levels of NAD and FAD will not be depleted because complex 1 and complex 2 will still be functioning. So fenformin is an anti-diabetic drug, but however, it has been currently withdrawn, which is a highly specific inhibitor of complex 3. Similarly, we have antimycin A, which is a bacterial metabolite and therefore has toxic effects. This also inhibits complex 3. And then we have dimercarpol, which is used for treatment of arsenic poisoning, which also is also a very specific inhibitor of complex 3. So if I add any of these inhibitors, the transport of electrons from complexes 1 and 2 will be impaired uh, to complex from complexes 1 and 2 to complex 4 will be impaired. Will the proton gradient still be created? The answer is yes because complex 1 is functioning. Complex 4 of course will not be functioning because electron transport is not taking place between complex 3 and complex 4. So we will create a proton gradient but the proton motive force will not be strong enough like an un uninhibited cell. So we may have some ATP generation, but the electron transport chain as a whole will be inhibited. However, when I put an inhibitor for complex 3, NAD plus and FAD will still be regenerated and these will then, these can then be used for the oxidation of other substrates. We come to complex 4 and if I inhibit complex 4, the most important effect that I will observe here is the lack of ox uh, reduction of oxygen to water. Of course, we will still create some proton gradient, we will regenerate NAD and FAD, but we will not be producing any kind of water or oxygen will not be reduced to water because complex 4 participates in this process. So these inhibitors and out of these inhibitors you should always remember cyanide which affects or, or completely impairs 
complex 4. Apart from that, we have carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas, and hydrogen sulfide, or H2S. Both of these gases impair the function of complex 4. Azide is a fungicide, which is often used, and it also impairs complex 4. So in, if I impair complex 4, to reiterate what I said, I will still be regenerating NAD and FAD, but I will not be reducing oxygen to water, although the whole electron transport chain will be impaired. Now we have inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation, and these inhibitors specifically target complex 5, that is the ATP synthase complex, which is responsible for the generation of ATP. Now, you can understand that these inhibitors, if I add these inhibitors to the cell, I will not be producing any ATP, although I will be creating a proton motive force, because although the proton gradient is created, since this particular complex is inhibited, ADP and PI will not give rise to ATP. So, chemical molecules such as oligomycin, which is a bacterial metabolite, and dicyclohexyl carbamide are inhibitors which specifically attenuate the function of the ATP synthase complex or completely inhibit the function of the ATP synthase complex. Once this complex is inhibited, there will not be any production of ATP, although I will again regenerate NAD and FAD and also produce water. However, although I have created a proton gradient, since this particular complex is completely impaired, no ATP will be produced. Then these are the list of some of the uncouplers that you need to know. I will just define what an uncoupler is. So uncouplers are molecules or proteins that create a proton leak, allowing the protons to re-enter the mitochondrial matrix without capturing any ATP, um, capturing any energy as ATP. That means the protons that are pumped into the intermembrane space will return into the mitochondrial matrix but not through the ATP synthase complex. They will just come back through other routes because of leaks that are created by these molecules. So what happens if an uncoupler is used? I am able to regenerate NAD, I am able to produce water, however I am not able to synthesize any ATP because the protons are not coming back inside the mitochondrial matrix through the ATP synthase complex. Also, one of the phenomena associated with uncouplers is the production of heat. So this, this is what the uncouplers specifically do. So that brings us to the end of the electron transport chain lecture, as I mentioned. I, my main goal was to talk about the transport of electrons and then talk about how the proton gradient is created, the, basics definition, the basic definitions of proton motive force and the chemiosmotic model. Um, also I explained but I have uploaded a document which talks about them in a bit of detail and will help you to understand the lecture better. But the most important part of the lecture is uh, the list of inhibitors which I have grouped according to the site of action. And why they are important? Because many a times people will be asking you questions regarding poisoning and the side effects of drugs. And many of these poisons or drugs, they specifically attenuate the function of one of these electron transport chain complexes. So that come, brings us to the end of electron transport chain and the next lecture will be on pentose phosphate pathway that is to look into how hexose in the form of glucose is converted to pentose in the form of ribose 5-phosphate and this particular pathway is also clinically relevant because 
it is responsible for the production of NADPH, which I mentioned uh, flittingly uh, in citric acid cycle, telling you not to focus on that particular entity for the time being, but we will talk about it in detail when we talk about the pentose phosphate pathway. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. All the best and have a nice day.